Hello brothers and sisters. I would like to share something with you here. And gimmicks. I want to talk to you about con artists and snake oil salesmen. salesmen. So whenever you go to the circus, you know there's these little quirks and we have as human beings that are easy to manipulate and I'm, I'm glad thank God I wanted to say this controlling the mob that's what I'm gonna name this controlling the mob see whenever you have large groups of people there are actual analytics and and algorithms they have seen that are able to be manipulated so they use that a lot around election time right playing people against one another and it's the Helgalian dialect, and that's the control, the antithesis, the thesis, so thesis, antithesis, antithesis, and create a synthesis. So that's, that's the way that they just play the Republican-Democrat idea, the donkey and the elephant, right? So they just play those against one another and but simultaneously you see that it changes wherever they want it to go it's just kinda trying to create more division and that same exact concept if you're understanding the analogies and the, the metaphors that we're going with here as we reel all these things in because we see it in TV propaganda and doctrine that's what it is. That's what the. That's how it's used. That's how it's implemented. And so, in magic, you have a gimmick, and and what that is is that's how they're actually performing the trick. Like, for example, if you take five one hundred dollar bills and five one dollar bills, you you can have a gimmick in the middle of those that flip it, but people won't see the gimmick because that's the hidden aspect of the trick, and all magic tricks have that. So. There's always the gimmick, is what they call it, and, and hiding the, the really creative ways of hiding something and presenting it so it looks like you just pulled it out of thin air. So, But the gimmick is, is you might have it in your sleeve, and when you do like that, it just appears, and, and it seems like you got some roses out of nowhere, but they're obviously like in your coat and in your sleeves, and they have little props that they bring things out of, so... That's the idea of a gimmick, and a snake oil salesman is the one who comes juggling into town and he's selling his 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 magic formula, like what they've done with the Kai Berry and Amway and these different get rich quick schemes, which are always pyramidal in nature. So we're also talking about pyramid schemes because that's how it goes. You have to have a doctrine behind what you're making a name for, and you have to have a brand, or else it wouldn't sell, right? So, it's the new year, <laughs> and um, <clears throat> I want to show you an example of this magic, grammary, snake oil salesman mentality, and and show you how they use these gimmicks within their, their writings and they change the meanings of words and they they use grammary g-r-a-m-a-r-y look up the etymology it's related to grammar right so it's it's using language like magic the same way they've changed the word clairoy to clergy and they got the word clerk from that and they it has nothing to do with the original context but they still are using those same words even today that were being used in the Greek being transferred in the New Testament and even the word issue and gloss if you look in the Webster's 1828 dictionary will tell you that those are actually thought to be related to a Hebrew word so issue like the sun issues forth his light the woman issues forth her Children, like the man issues the things, and the women issue the things that are necessary for the generative principle in nature, and which is the often at least the combination of the seed and the fruit, the seed and the.
flower and it closes and ripens in its fruit and even with man and woman there's analogies like that about the flower and the um the the way that they would break the ground with the plow and i know that's a mature conversation and i hope that there's a mature audience here so but i wanted to read something from the local issue of the the church of christ it says new is nice and it's speaking to the new year they're speaking to times so even the language here is already being charged with this greater contextual idea people have about these holy days holidays which are actually unholy days that are thousands of years old and they've been preserved by tradition so one moment it's going to get loud there's a truck over there Okay, so this paper says, New is nice, and they're speaking to the New Year. See, it says, Happy New Year at the end. So they're playing on a commercial scheme already, and this is from the local Church of Christ here, where I'm at. So it says, Except for those hardcore antique collectors, most of us really like things that are new. Some like the look and smell of a new car, while others are impressed with a new outfit that flashes the newest fashion trend. The announcement of a new product in the technology field, such as a new generation phone, drives millions to the store. As the title says, new is nice. Though I am writing in mid-November, it's likely that you are reading this several weeks into 2018. There is always something exciting about a new year. The new calendar, journal, or diary represents a fresh start. All of the cross-out appointments, corrected phone numbers, and coffee stains are gone. A new year seems to offer... A challenge to greatness and improve and improved efficiency. So, and they're talking about New Year's. So I'm going to skip forward, and it says the concept of new beginnings. And remember, this is American speaking who usually don't know much about the Bible. So they're obviously thinking this in the context of what the world would call proselyte. So the concept of new beginnings is present in the Bible. In Romans 6, 3-4, the Apostle Paul wrote his Christian friends in the empirical capital, or do, you know, or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into his death. Exactly. But nothing to do with being dunked in water. That's not what's even being stated at all if you actually read it. It's talking about being put into and staying in not being dunked in water and coming out of water what we're baptized into his death and then we're we we come to life that's the words sorry one moment it just slipped my mind so that's the words for fulake prison and then we come to the pro orizzo predestination because we've always been and and that God already knew what we would do here, and He had prepared a way for us, and and now we're alive, walking. Now we're alive, walking in that light with the blood of Jesus that cleanses us as we're renewed day to day. But they're talking about dunking people in water here. It says because that's all American. An American who read read this would actually know. They they haven't done any research into baptism or the Greek word baptism or what the baptism usually means in the New or what it means in the New Testament, because it's not even a concept in the Old Testament. So you have to look at where proselyte baptism versus spiritual baptism and put those things into the proper perspective as you read through the New Testament to understand what's it, when's it talking about being baptized with Holy Spirit and fire, and when's it talking about proselyte Jewish baptism, preserving a Jewish ritual, which according to Colossians 2 has been blotted out. So he says, therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life, as we do. When we die, we come back to life, and we are, that's called the cross, because this world hates us as it hated Jesus, because greater is he that's in you than he is that's in the world. They can't understand our speech, because they speak of the world, and we speak of God. So he goes on, baptism and the new life in Christ do not eliminate all of our problems. It will not reduce our weight or increase our 401k. It will not instantly make enemies like us or immune, immunize us against illness, rejection, and disappointment. 
Baptism will not remove all the consequences of scars that we bear from past bad decisions or sin. And they're talking about water again. They're not. It, that's not even what it's talking about. And and all four witnesses, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all capture the fact that Jesus would baptize with Holy Spirit and with fire, pneuma and pur. It's the pneuma that brings the logos, and that's the Spirit brings the word. And the people who don't believe flee flee from the word. Genesis chapter three and Exodus that when. God was thundering and lightning from the mountain and the fire, they get away from his voice, just like the writer in Hebrews brings up. And Jesus says the, that the spirit moves where it wills and you hear its voice, but you can't tell from where it comes from or where it goes. And that's in the complete biblical library, which is, these are important concepts. If, if you want to familiarize yourself with who Jesus is God incarnate, Emmanuel in Matthew chapter 1, Emmanuel, God with us, uh, Yahweh in a body, and he came through the womb of Mary and was born of a virgin as Isaiah predicted. So Isaiah said, I want, a virgin is with child and they shall call his name Emmanuel. So it's very important. So he goes on. However, baptism does offer the forgiveness of sins. Exactly as Paul described in Acts 22, 16, baptism brings renewed hope, re-energized purpose for living, and a new relationship with Almighty God, secured not by our accomplishments, but by the blood of Jesus. It is new life, and there is nothing any better. So you can see that they even understand these concepts, but when you're using that word, you're playing on carnality. Because if you don't put that separation there, you understand that there will be an argument between the Jewish ritual that's been blotted out of the idea of making one proselyte. And once he's made, he's twofold the child of hell because he thinks he's closer to God. And now he's been given worldly authority and power like the high priests and Herod and Pontius Pilate. And all of the people from Acts chapter 4 that killed Jesus. And that's the people who kill us in this world. Like they killed William Tyndale. Henry the 8th, I believe it was. And he sent out people to spy out and find William Tyndale for translating the Bible into English. You couldn't do it. And the Lollards and Wycliffe had, John Wycliffe had done it. And John Huss and all these martyrs. People who have been put to death. By the worldly systems of government, school, business, and, and, sorry, government, business, school, and church. And that's why they forced the word church in the third edict of the 15 edicts from King James over the boards of translators at Harvard, or sorry, at Oxford, not, not Harvard, Oxford and Cambridge. So, that's what it's talking about here. It's using the times. It's using the will of the year. Because guess what? This isn't a new year. What? Is it, we're going around the sun. We're tearing through space. And we're moving like this. Way through space. As we hold on to the sun. From, and that's from the different perspectives of trying to see how we're doing this in a really grand cosmos. And the cosmos was thought by Zeno to be composed of pneuma and pur, and Stoic terminology, which were the best language of the Greek time to transfer the New Testament in during a bilingual time when some people were speaking Aramaic in that area, and some people were speaking Greek, but the best language at that time was Greek because Alexander the Great had conquered the world before it was divided to the, I believe it's called the Dodoke, which is the, the, I can't remember how to say it, but it's the four generals, and it was Lys, Ly, Lysimachus, and, and Seleucid, and Ptolemy, and there was another one there, I can't think of his name, so, but that's the vision that Daniel had and the different kingdoms that would come and that's the one spoken of of Revelation with the seven heads because it's Garden of Eden, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, the head that received the wound, Roman Catholicism and now today with what's in the world with the reformations and the different spreads of these house churches and that's what it is, it's just church 
the dogmas and the man-made decrees from someone who they have lifted up as a Cain or Diotrephes or a Korah as a mighty man upon the earth to rule for them. But David was a mighty man of valor too, but he worshipped Yahweh and he was constantly under the cross and under trials and persecuted and being tortured his whole life. I mean, I mean read his story. So I hope that this helps and I just wanted to do a little breakdown of like what the Church of Christ put in my mailbox and just show you that they play on these kinds of things, the observances of times, the astrology, and and then using that as a way to bring in their commercial snake oil with the gimmick that people don't realize is a gimmick using the language of grammar. And I learned this from one of the people I subscribe to on, who, who look at body language. It says the mind cannot no, or it says the eye cannot see what the mind does not know. So if you read this, you just see what you know, right? And and what people know is proselyte. They don't know God when you speak to them and you try to just look for an understanding within one another and a fellowship 